Hi, this is The Advisor with Stacey Chalemi, founder of The Complete Herbal Guide. I'm very excited today because we have a very special guest with us. It's Mark Bello. As an attorney and a civil justice advocate, author Mark M. Bello draws upon over 40 years of courtroom experience in his and combining his legal experience and passion for justice with a creative writing style, Mark not only brings high quality legal services to his clients, but a captivating novels to his readers. So Mark, why don't you tell a little about yourself and what you do? Well, first of all, Stacey, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure oh, you're very to be welcome. Um, I uh, practiced law for a long time. I handled cases involving mainly personal injuries, people that, that uh, suffered some kind of loss. Mm -hmm. And uh, my job was to essentially to uh, obtain justice for them. Right. Following that career and, and deciding to retire, uh, I got bored. And I said, you know, I, there was a case in my career that I consider my, the case of my career, for lack of a better way to say it. And I had always promised myself that I'd write a book about it. When I retired, after raising a family, after spending much of my time either with my family or with my office, mm -hmm. I finally had some time on my hands and I sat down and wrote this book. I thought I was going to be a one and done author. I thought I, it was a bucket list item. Right. I'd write it, I'd finish it, and I'd be done. And then the 2016 election came along. And I, whether you're a, a Trump supporter or a, or a Clinton supporter, uh, is beside the point. For me, it was some of the things that were being said during the campaign troubled me. Right. And I, and I said to myself, what would America look like if a bigot became president of the United States? So I wrote a book about uh, a bigoted president of the United States. Uh, once I realized that I could write a book that wasn't something I experienced personally, although some would say that you, <laughs> that you <laughs> experienced the 2016 election personally. <laughs> Once I realized I could write a book about something that I didn't experience, uh, I started writing what I would call ripped from the headlines novels about topics in the news. And that's Interesting. kind of where, I, where I'm at now. Now, did you always have a passion for writing or was this something that just came about as time went on? I had a degree in English literature. Okay. I did a lot. I did a lot of writing in college. You obviously do a lot of writing uh, in a law practice, right? Br briefs and motions and complaints and what have you. The art of language, the written word, the oral uh, word, is important in the in the practice of law. So, I wouldn't say I had a passion for writing, but I, mm -hmm. but I was a good writer, enjoyed it, and, and parlayed that into a post-retirement career. It's, it's more of an expensive hobby, but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I guess you could call it a career. I've written now um, eight Zachary Blake novels. Wow. Just, as we discussed off the air, I wrote, I recently wrote a cozy mystery that I'm about to release. Oh, so that's, nice! That's kind of new and fun. Yeah, I've written I've written a Jewish cookbook, a recipe uh, book that's mm -hmm. kind of fun. It, and it, the the slant on that is that the book is the recipes of my legal thriller protagonist family, not my own. Mm -hmm. So I what I did is I take my own family recipes and turn them into his, and I oh, had fun wow. and I had fun do, doing that. Uh, and I've written a couple of children's books uh, about safety and justice. So I'm having a good time doing a, a variety of things with my writing. So how many books are right now published? Ten. Wow. 
Eight and Zachary how- Blake, the cookbook, and one children's book. Very nice. Now, did was it hard for you to write your first book? It, or was it, you know, did it take a long time to put everything together? That book was called, is, is called Betrayal of Faith. It is about an actual case I handled in my practice, mm-hmm. although I fictionalized it so that I had a license to right. uh, embe- embellish uh, mm-hmm. quite, quite a bit, I would say. Yeah. Uh, but the book is about the clergy abuse scandal. Mm-hmm. Uh, two boys get mistreated by a priest. Uh, the church tries to cover up the crime. And a young solo practitioner, uh, David, takes on the church institution, the Goliath. Right. Uh, and slings his his uh, his stone, mm-hmm. uh, his slingshot, and and with a bullseye at the uh, <laughs> at the Goliath institution. Um, the book, as I indicated earlier, based on my own experience, right. while it took longer to write because it was my first, it was somewhat easier to write because I wrote it from experience. Right. Uh, but it, it, what, it did take me a long time, uh, both pre-retirement. A lot of that was, was because of other things I was doing at the time. Once I retired and had time on my hands, it became an easier endeavor. Now, you know, there are a lot of people out there that want to become writers and, you know, they have a, a, a dream just like you to write a book. Now, for those people, what advice would you give them on how to start? You know, because so many people have in back of their head, you know, one day I want to write a book about X, Y, and Z. Um, what what kind of suggestions do you have for people like that? Well, I, I have two suggestions. One is practical. One is uh, probably not practical. <laughs> uh, the, the, the not practical is follow your dreams, follow your heart. Do mm-hmm. what it is you want to do uh, and do the best you can at it. Right. Having said that, it is not easy. Uh, I was surprised that I could do it. Uh, so I don't encourage people not to try, but I encourage people to be realistic about who they are and what they can do. It is not easy to write a 100,000-word novel, right. an 80,000-word novel. It's not easy at all. So if you don't have any writing talent, it might not be something you want to do. (laughs) Uh, Having said that, uh, if you collaborate with somebody and you tell somebody your story, maybe that is something that could turn into a a sellable novel. There's a difference, by the way, between writing a good novel and writing one that people will buy. I've mastered the first. I haven't mastered the second. (laughs) (laughs) Now, did you create outlines or did you write in a journal and and place your ideas down? Like, how did you organize everything to make this novel? I've learned in this business that there's something called a plotter Mm -hmm. and a pantser. Have you heard that expression before? It was new to me. I've heard of the plotter, but I haven't heard the plant. plant. A A pantser is somebody who writes by the seat of their pants and doesn't plot things out. Okay. A, a plotter, obviously, is the person you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Someone who who creates a hey, who has an idea, creates a an outline, uh, synopsis of the plot, and then and then writes the book. I'm much more of a pantser than a plotter. Right. But that doesn't mean it's not a good idea to be a plotter. Uh, most people who write uh, do do prepare an outline and a synopsis and write from what they prepared. Right. I just don't don't happen to be one of them. I don't think there's any wrong or right way. Um, You know, I I think, you know, some, you know, sometimes like even for me, when I wrote my books, you know, I started out, you know, writing it with a certain idea. And by the time I got to the mid point or towards the end, I was switching things around, taking things out, adding new things, moving chapters around. So you really, you know, until you get that end product, you don't really know, you know, it's kind of, you know, when you're creating, 
anything is possible. Anything could happen. Absolutely. Even if you're a plotter, a, a book can can turn out to be something completely different right. than you plotted. And and by I, the way, I, when I when I say I'm a pantser, I certainly have an idea in my mind. I certainly one thing I do is I write a a synopsis, uh, beginning to end mm -hmm. of what of what I'm about to write, and I try to stick to it as best I can. Right. But as, as you indicated, in, in the flow of your work, as ideas start to come to you, especially as a pantser, yeah, um, it it can take a, it can take on a different direction. The best example I can give you is I wrote a book, my third book called Betrayal in Blue. It was about a small time town police department uh, who decides to uh, arrest and put on trial a large town police officer. Right. Small town cops versus large town cops. Right. And they wanted to make an example of this cop. What are you doing in my town? Right. Don't, don't come here and, and commit crimes. We don't care who you are. Right. Now, the fact that the guy was innocent was lost on them, but that's beside the point. <laughs> so uh, I had somebody read my first draft and they said, you know, this would be much better if you involved a third party police force if perhaps the FBI got involved. Right. That's and I said, good. that's an interesting idea. Mm -hmm. There was a ter there was a terrorist element involved and and the cop was being framed and the FBI being involved was logical. Mm -hmm. So I rewrote the book based on the recommendations and it became a much better book. Right. Not not at all what I planned, but it became a much better book. I think, uh, you know, it, it, it sounds like a, a lot of the cases that you took on as an attorney and then things that happened in the media and in the news kind of played a big influence on the books that you, you've written over the course of your years. Now, were, were a lot of these um, ideas coming from your, from your career as an attorney and from, from the media news? Well, the answer is it was a combination of the two, mm -hmm. but certainly sitting down to write a particular book, at least I, I, I wrote, I've written eight Zachary Blake legal thrillers, four to four or five of them are based on newsworthy events mm -hmm. that have happened in America. The, the clergy abuse scandal, obviously is a newsworthy event in America. Right. It was written based on personal experience. So that that's the only one that, it, that is actually, that was actually pulled from my practice, but I've handled cases of police brutality and wrote a book about, uh, the police shooting innocent black citizens in a traffic stop mm -hmm. that was based on the Philando Castile case that happened in Minnesota. It wasn't my case. It was a news uh, reported case where a young black man with his, with his wife and a kid in the car get pulled over by a cop and suddenly this guy's a threat. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote a book about a Supreme Court justice candidate who has a sexual assault in his resume. That's obviously based on the Brett Kavanaugh hearings. Right. It isn't about Brett Kavanaugh, mm -hmm. but it was inspired by Brett Kavanaugh. I wrote a book about a school shooting inspired by the Parkland shootings in, in Florida. My nephew was a, a student at the middle school next door to Parkland and was put on lockdown. So that was personal to me, right. but it, it didn't happen to me. It wasn't a case in my practice. So things like that, I, 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 it's a combination of the two, I would say. So it's really issues that you felt were at 
importance to society and, and to you yourself, things that you you felt needed to be expanded and, and talked about more, but you turned it more into a, a fictional writing. This way you could actually write about the situation and expand on it, but give people a perspective of some of the things that are going on in this world and maybe give people some time to to reevaluate and think about, you know, the importance of so how some of these issues are impacting us as as a society. That's exactly right. And I, I also what we don't hear about when we hear about these incidents is what the legal system does with them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it, I, a lot of when I do a podcast, a lot of people want to talk about OJ. And the, inter <laughs> the interesting thing about OJ that you don't hear about in other cases is the two trial situation that he experienced. He got tried and found innocent or, well, innocent uh, because the prosecution could not prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. Right. He then got tried civilly, where the standard was much lower, mm -hmm. 51.49 or 50.5 or 50.1, It's almost like the, uh, yeah. the election last night. <laughs> uh, uh, a very small margin is all you need in a civil case. Right. Most, most people don't realize that. So when you take, when you take, for instance, I didn't realize look, that when you take a look at, for instance, a school shooting or a, uh, an innocent black person um, or a, an innocent citizen doesn't have to be black, but an innocent citizen yes. got in a, in a traffic stop, whatever you did wrong uh, that caused you to be stopped by the police, it isn't a death penalty offense necessarily a and B the cop is not the judge or the jury. He mm -hmm. doesn't have the right to execute you or, or determine what you're, a sentence should be. The criminal case that developed from that, a lot of the cops, for instance, in situations like that, are found not criminally responsible, and a prosecutor refuses to press charges or, or pursue charges against a cop criminally. What happens next? The citizen takes on the cop and sues him civilly. That's underreported. The cop is held responsible. He's just not held responsible criminal. So what my books do, both in terms of the um, school shooting book called Betrayal High mm -hmm. and the uh, police shooting book called Betrayal in Black, it takes a deep dive into the civil justice system and how uh, a judge or a jury or a mediator in the case of um, the school shooting would handle the uh, cases civil rather than criminal. All we hear about is, oh, the community decided not to press charges. But the citizen, the, the loved ones of the, of the person who has been shot, uh, doesn't take that lying down Right. Pursues it civilly, and in my practice, I handle a lot of those, and there are a lot of good attorneys out there who handle those civilly. And I tried to make, um, I tried to write a book that explained to, that explains to the reader how that would work in real life. So you're not biased in any way where you have, you know, you let your feelings or your own personal opinion affect the book. You try to be as unbiased as possible, or you do have certain <laughs> viewpoints and that you want to make those viewpoints clear on how you feel. I, I, I will candidly tell you that I'm not an unbiased observer of, of these situations. Mm -hmm. I, I write from the, from the perspective of a former plaintiff lawyer. Mm -hmm. rep representing the citizens against the institutions. I like to write David versus Goliath type right. uh, novels, like I described earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, all of the situations I just described to you are the the citizen against the powerful. Right. Uh, if you if you're talking about betrayal of faith, my first book, my first book, it's a citizen 
and and their mother against the church. Right. In the second book, uh, Zachary Blake takes on the president of the United States um, on behalf of a Muslim woman who's falsely accused of uh, a, a, bur- a murder. Uh, what happens in that book, by the way, it's kind of interesting. A white supremacist bombs a mosque. The police in Dearborn, Michigan, which is a heavily Muslim community, uh, are slow to investigate. And this woman, who's a Muslim herself, decides to do her own little private investigation and actually identifies who the um, per- perpetrator is. Right. She, ha- she follows him and witnesses his murder. When she goes to render aid, she's arrested for murdering him. She pulls the knife out of his gut uh, at his request and is caught holding the bloody knife. <laughs> so so she's literally holding the murder woman. The president of the United States, who wants to deport all Muslims, gets involved in the case and wants to make sure she's convicted. So, again, David versus Goliath. Right. Uh, in the In the third book, uh, that I described to you is kind of Goliath versus David. It, it, the small town takes on the big town and uh, it, it kind of reverses the roles. Then you have the school shooting and the the kids' family against uh, the city and county where the shooting happened. In the uh, Supreme Betrayal, the book about the Supreme Court, you've got a very wealthy judge being uh, accused by a young woman. Um, so, yes, I mean, I write from the perspective of uh, the victim rather than the perspective of the insurance company or the defendant. Right. But I, but I, to your point, I, I do try to properly explain the standard of, of responsibility to prove the case what's what's necessary to get it done and what a person has to go through to pursue a case in the civil justice system. I write about the criminal justice system sometimes, mm-hmm. but I, but I'm much less of a criminal uh, justice expert than I am a civil. You know, a lot of these things, you know, and it bothers me too, you know, we have, a, we live in a society that is so stigmatized, you know, the United States is supposed to be a free country where we have free speech, free action, you know, and, and all this great stuff that a lot of third world countries don't have, but yet our society carries so much hatred, why we have to be biased towards someone's, you know, color or what what someone's religion is or, you know, what they choose, whether it be abortion or not abortion. Is it really the, the individual's right to choose, you know, and judge someone on their beliefs or their nationality or in their cultures? And, and, and in our society, you know, um, you know, people have really, I think, have lost the the values, you know, that we were taught about living in America and, and be, ha- being able to be who we want to be as long as we don't hurt others. And but yet we still have so much hatred towards people, uh, you know, in certain cultures, certain religions, certain, you know, um, ethnic grounds, you know, backgrounds. And, you know, how does that make you feel? You know, because a lot of your your um, books are based on, you know, people being, you know, unjustly, you know, um, hurt in some way or another. And, you know, it's like, how do you stop the stigmatism in our, our society? How do we get people to, you know, stop that hatred and be more accepted upon each other as individuals and, and our own person? Well, candidly, it makes me feel terrible uh, to, to your question. To your point about how do we do this or how do we stop it, uh, don't stop speaking out about it. Mm-hmm. The, the main purpose for my books and, you know, I don't want to get on my soapbox, but for my crusade, let's call it, yes, is to draw attention to these issues and do my small part 
in making them public. If, you know, whether Brett Kavanaugh was guilty of sexually assaulting, um, what was her name, Christine Blasey Ford? I think so. I think. I don't know the answer to that question. But I do know that a citizen should be able to speak truth to power. Right. And when she tried to do that, she got attacked by the right, to mm-hmm. your point. She was doing what she thought was the right thing. On the other side, Brett Kavanaugh and his supporters thought that was a hit job, as he called it. Mm-hmm. I don't know what's true. If she was lying, that's terrible. She uh, hurt his reputation mm-hmm. if, if she was lying. Right. She seemed to me to be a credible witness, and she was testifying under oath. Mm-hmm. And I have my doubts as to whether she was lying. When you vilify someone who is not a public figure and is not seeking the limelight, you prevent future people from coming forward. Right. And that's the unfortunate thing about that. The bottom line is, when you talk about Kavanaugh, and again, I'm not saying he's guilty or innocent, uh, but I decided to write a book about the issue. And my guy, in my book, was guilty as hell. He's the most evil character I've created to date in eight books. He was the son of a bitch. Mm-hmm. Um, but the issue is, do you want a person like that sitting on your Supreme Court? Right. The answer, obviously, is no. Mm-hmm. Do you want a person like Trump sitting in the Oval Office? For me, the answer is no. Mm-hmm. For some of your listeners, the answer might be absolutely, because I like his policies. I don't understand how his moral character is not a deal breaker for people. But that's for others to answer, not for me. That's my line in the sand. My pocketbook issues are not as important to me as morality issues. Right. Some people don't care about those things. And I think, to your point, that more people should care about those things. Character is a very, very important issue in our politics, in our courts, and you want people of character serving in high governed positions and high judicial positions. I think, you know, people in our society that have a role that demonstrates power and, and that, you know, demonstrates um, some, you know, that are looked upon as mentors, you know, in our society. We have many people in politics and we have many people in the media who are celebrities. Um, you know, people look up to them, especially the younger generation, as as mentors, these are the people that, you know, they they tend to follow and, and people will even change their their personalities because they admire somebody and they want to be like that person when they should be their own person and have their own, you know, and be happy with themselves, you know, look inside themselves and say, who am I as a person and, and stick with those characteristics and stick with that personality. But we tend to follow a lot of followers in our society instead of leaders. But it, you know, it, it's it's heartwarming. It's it's kind of heartbreaking actually when we see people um, that you know, are taking powerful positions, you know, and abusing them and not being the the, the kind of mentors and showing, you know, because value to me, values and characters, you know, our character and our, and the values that we have play an important part of, of what we accomplish in life. And it also sets the values and characters of younger generations and, you know, helps them grow into a a good human being. Don't you think? I agree with you. I, I, I would, I would draw a distinction, however, between politicians and judges and public figures in the entertainment business, Mm -hmm. a person who can sing, a person who can act doesn't necessarily do so seeking public attention or seeking to be a public figure that people follow. Mm -hmm. A person who becomes a judge has citizens in front of him or her 
and are required, in my opinion, to be responsible citizens who ethically sit in judgment of other people Mm -hmm. and have a moral and ethical responsibility to be good people. Same thing with a politician. If you seek public office, if you seek to re- to represent citizens mm-hmm. of the United States, whether at the highest level, as Trump was, or or a congressman, or a senator, or even a local councilman, if you seek public office, then you have a ethical responsibility and a moral responsibility to be a solid citizen. Otherwise you can't sit in judgment of others. I would apply that to a police officer too, which is why I wrote betrayal in black. I, I, I don't think that a police officer can do what he does or she does based on their perception of how a particular race should behave. Right. I'm thinking more like um, Roe versus Wade when they when they voted, they brought back, you know, should we make abortion legal or not legal? You know, after it, you know, that was a past event that we already went through, and then you know it, it was brought back and it was brought into the judicial system. You're and absolutely it, right. Yeah, you know, you're make, you're kind of making my point for me. Yeah, I I first I personally believe that regardless of the fact that there's a six to three majority in the Supreme Court and suddenly the so-called tide has turned. They had a responsibility. Stare decisis requires them to adhere to case precedent and case precedent. They created this fiction that 50 years of precedent was meaningless right and it and it isn't it's a long time and to suddenly overturn 50 years of precedent because ideologically the there was a a a right-wing shift in the supreme court while they have the right to do it the supreme court can overturn any case they have the right to do it Mm -hmm. but i don't think it was the right thing to do Right. Based on on how Supreme Court precedent works. They invented their own theory Mm -hmm. as to why Roe versus Wade should be uh, overturned. Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, if you're a student of history and you go back to 1973. Right. You would struggle to find as a legal scholar. And I don't. I don't claim to be a legal scholar, but but it, it, you would struggle to find any sort of right to privacy embodied in our Constitution. Right. So, so you might argue that Roe versus Wade was decided improperly back in 1973. Mm-hmm. Once it was decided, however, it became the law of the land. It was the law of the land for 50 years. And to... And to uh, lie and say that it wasn't established precedent, which is what Sam Alito said in his decision, Mm -hmm. is is absurd. Think of the infrastructure that has been created in America that is related to the right to an abortion or the right to choose. Right. That infrastructure had to be completely torn apart as a result of that decision. So mm-hmm. to, su- to suggest that it was not uh, a a that there, there was no infrastructure created as a result of fifty years of precedent was an absurd premise in the first place. They could have easily and had and had tremendous uh, amount of constitutional authority to sustain Roe versus Wade and chose not to, not for judicial reasons, not for legal reasons, but for political reasons. And that's my problem. Right. And I think that's what you meant. Yes, that's exactly what I meant. Yes. Now, 
you also are you in the process of writing a mystery you said or are you um or have you published that mystery yet in 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 addition to the eight legal thrillers mm -hmm. i i have published let's talk about that first i have published a children's book about mm -hmm. about bullying based on racial differences right which we can talk about and i've published a cookbook uh, a Jewish recipe cookbook, which are the recipes from my family mm -hmm. uh, going back a hundred years. But I, in a, in a little twist, uh, I created a fictionalized version of these recipes, made them Zachary Blake's family recipes. And I do some kibitzing in, in the, in the cookbook, tell some anecdotes some are true. Some are based on my own family's history. Right. Some are invented as, as his family history. And I had a lot of fun writing that. Uh, we can talk about those two if you want. Sure. But to your point about the uh, legal mystery, I've written for the first time a legal novel, uh, a, a whodunit mystery that is not a Zachary Blake legal thriller, but a uh, kind of a cozy mystery in the in the spirit of Murder She Wrote or Agatha Christie, and and I'm not in any way, shape, or form suggesting to your listeners that I that I can write like Agatha Christie. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I'll let them decide. But but I I've, I've written a novel where a uh, middle aged woman, former judge, by the name of Rosalind Maxwell. Mm -hmm is the central character. So I've written a, a female lead, a female protagonist novel, uh, who done it. And it, it lays out probably, uh, five, six suspects and the reader has to decide whether the accused is the murderer right. or whether some of these other suspects are the murder. And I had a lot of fun. It was, it was nice to write something different for a change as it was when I wrote the children's book. Right. I've written a second children's book that hasn't been released yet. Uh, and the cookbook. Now for the children's book, what made you focus on bullying? Well, as a, as a Jewish kid, I was bullied myself when I was young. Mm -hmm. I, I was at, a, I, I used to attend a school in Detroit. I live in Michigan. That was almost 100% Jewish. Mm -hmm. We lived in a Jewish neighborhood and the school had mostly Jewish students and maybe there were one or two Christians in each class. Mm -hmm. Nobody bullied them, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, when my, my mother and dad decided to move. And they moved to a Detroit suburb. And while the house that they bought was being built, mm -hmm. we moved into a community uh, in a rental mm -hmm. for a year. And I went to school. And for the first time, I became a Jewish minority student. Mm -hmm. So a kid comes up to me and he says, uh, nice to meet you. He was very friendly and, and asked me what church I was going to attend. Well, I didn't know you're not supposed to, uh, you're supposed to hide your ethnic identity. So I said, I don't attend church. I attend synagogue. Mm -hmm. And he knocked me to the ground. Oh my goodness. Um, we don't like your kind around here. That's something that stayed with me all these years. Oh yeah. I, I was probably 12 years old, 11 years old. Mm-hmm. The kid in my book is younger, but but it stayed with me all these years. Yeah. Uh, so I, I decided to write a book mm -hmm. about the experience. What I decided to write, however, was a book about a biracial child who was attending kindergarten for the first time. Now, why choose a kid that young? For me, the answer is, I don't think we're 
letting kids know that these things are out there at a young enough age. Right. I, I believe, and I'll talk to you about my second book in a second. I believe we're delivering these messages at too late an age. Mm -hmm. And if you deliver it at too late an age, you're delivering it to, to a kid who's already a bully. Yeah. So the point in having the child be bullied in kindergarten was to let children in elementary school know how terrible this is, mm -hmm. what a terrible experience it is for the kid who was bullied, and perhaps nip a future bully in the bud. Right. The second book is a safety book. It's about distracted driving, and a family gets into an auto accident because uh, a teenager is texting and driving. Again, the book is a story in rhyme, like mm -hmm. the first book. And it's for children, I would say, four to eight. Mm -hmm. And it tells you not to do two things at once. Right. You usually screw up if you try to do two things at once. Mm -hmm. try, doing, try doing them one at a time. Yes. And, and texting and driving or telephoning and driving are examples of that. Oh, tell, yeah. your, tell your parents to put down their phone. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have children, and I think you said you did. Yes, I have three children. Okay. If you have children, I have children and grandchildren now. Mm -hmm. And I see my grandchildren getting phones for safety purposes, which is the legitimate reason to have a phone. Right. Dial 911, dial your parents if you're in trouble. All those are good reasons to have a phone. But getting addicted to a phone at age 8, 9, 10 and using it when you're 16 mm -hmm. and driving, I'd like to see kids get messages like I deliver in my book that a phone is a good thing. Use it properly. Use it responsibly. Don't do two things at once. So my, my second book is about a little auto accident that happens as the result of distracted driving. Nobody gets hurt. Mm -hmm. It's nothing for, for parents or kids to get scared about. Yeah. But the negative consequences of doing two things at once, especially using a phone while driving. Yes. I want a kid to sit in the back seat in a car seat and say, Mom, Dad, put down the phone. So that's what I hope to accomplish with, with my second children. Well, my son was actually at a stop sign and someone crashed into him because they were texting and driving at the same time. And they had children in the back seat. And because she was texting and driving at the same time, she did not look to see. And she made a wide turn and crashed right into my son, who was, was hurt badly. I'm sorry he was hurt badly. That, that, that's off. Is he okay now? He's okay now. He suffers okay. from some pains from from the right. from the accident, but right. I didn't you know. want to, I didn't depict the the family to get hurt badly or get hurt at all. I, right. What I what I wanted to illustrate, and by the way, the accident you just described, other than the injury, is kind of exactly the accident I described in the in the little children's book I wrote. It's called mm -hmm. um, One Thing or Two. What should I do? Uh, <laughs> and it it basically tells the story of this little accident that they had. Right. But the, but the message is, it's not safe to drive with a phone in your hand. Exactly. You're, you're not just, you're not just, in this case, the kid was texting. But even if you're talking on the phone and looking ahead, your mind is not on your driving. Right. And it, it's just not a good idea. Even with the, with the uh, hands free and, and all that other stuff. You're still the being best, distracted. The best thing to do is, is to drive when you're supposed to drive and talk on the phone when you're supposed to talk on the phone. I agree 100%. Definitely. Have I covered everything now? Well, you didn't tell me about your fun cookbook yet. Tell me quickly about the recipes in your cookbook. Well, the recipes are all, again, old family recipes. Uh, your, your, Jewish, your Jewish listeners 
will recognize matzo ball soup and brisket mm-hmm. and, and uh, Passover dishes like uh, fried matzo and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kugel and um, rugluch mm-hmm. uh, and all sorts of good stuff. It, it, right. It's, but the fun part of the book, aside from the recipes, because the recipes, I'm not going to say that they're not good recipes. They are. And they're unique recipes. Right. My, my mother's apple pie, which is the world's greatest apple pie, is in the book. <laughs> as, as Zachary Blake's mother's recipes. Um, I, you know, I don't know what it's like in, in, uh, in your uh, religion or ethnic background, but in the Jewish religion, the old uh, bubbies, as we, as we call them, mm-hmm. grandmas, grandmas um, their recipes don't translate well. Right. What they used to what they used to do is take a pinch of this and a pinch of that, and they they used to call it a bissel, which mm-hmm. is, means a little. You yeah. take a bissel of this and a bissel of that, and, <laughs> and then you try to write it down. And what is it? Is is it a, a a a teaspoon? Is it a tablespoon? Is it a quarter inch? Is it a what is it? Right, right. And, and you don't have that information. <laughs> you don't yeah. have that information. So it it's hard to put down an old family recipe. Right. There's there so there's some jokes about about that and, and yeah. there's also there's also some some true stories from my family history and some made up stories, uh, you know like uh, uh, a blind uh, an almost blind woman going out to to try to hit a golf ball. Uh, it, I had some fun with it. Right. No, it's, it it's got a like lot it. of it's got a lot of humorous little stories in it uh, that I think readers will find fun, as well as some terrific recipes. That sounds great. Now, your new book. When are we going to expect that? Probably this spring. Okay. I'm still playing with it a bit. Are you going to? I'll, do... I'll send you the cover. Uh, the cover is beautiful. I, yes, I would love to see it. I don't have. Uh, I guess I could reverse a screen or something <laughs> you know my my tech my technical the reason it's i have okay. a co-host the reason i have a co-host in my uh, podcast is is because of that <laughs> i think i i think i can do this so hang on one second I'll show you the cover because it's really nice all right there's the cover now i can share my screen i think there can you see it or not? Oh, I see it now. Very nice. I it's like very, it. It's a very nice little cover. Yes. Very nice. Indeed. This this is a story of a of a college professor who's not a very nice guy. Mm-hmm. And a and a lot of people don't like him, we find out. Pretty quickly. I'm not ruining anything. Uh, we we find out that he's not a well liked or well respected guy, mm-hmm. and he gets murdered on the day he has a fight with the college president. Oh wow! The college president uh, obviously is accused of the murder, right? And the question is: Is the college president guilty of the murder, or did somebody else who doesn't like? <laughs> this nasty professor mm-hmm. uh, guilty of the murder. Oh, very nice. It's a, it's a, uh, uh, by the way, I, I wrote a whodunit, a Zachary Blake whodunit, which mm-hmm. is my last, my eighth novel. Right. That one is called You Have the Right to Remain Silent. Mm-hmm. It, is, it is the only book, Zachary Blake book I've written that doesn't have the word betrayal okay. in the title. But it it is kind of a whodunit, also. Right. This one though is, is a whole new character, a whole new genre. It's shorter than my other books. Right. And it was a lot of fun to to try something new, and I think it's a it, it's a an interesting and entertaining book, and I think people will like it. Well, the synopsis sounds very interesting. I look thank forward you, to you. seeing it. Yeah, that'll come out probably April, I would think, if if things go the way I hope they. Will. 
Now, before you go, can you tell everybody your website so they know where to go to find out more about you and everything else that you entail on the website? All of my books are available on any uh, of the online booksellers, including Amazon and Barnes and Noble and Kobo and Apple and, and all of those guys. They're not available typically in bookstores, although I here and there, I somebody tells me, uh, uh, calls me very excitedly. I saw your book in the library. I saw your book in, the, <laughs> in a bookstore. Uh, so once in a while, you can find them in a book. You can also look them up in a uh, I, I, if you're if these days in a bookstore, you can go to a computer, uh, Google an author, and mm -hmm. then ask the bookstore to order the book for you. Right. So so you can do that mm -hmm. if you're in a Barnes and Noble or something. But my books are typically available online just by putting in my name. If you put in Mark M, make sure you put my initial in there because there's okay. other Mark Bellows around. Mm -hmm. But Mark M Bellow will get you a listing of my books. Uh, they're available on Amazon. And my website is markmbello.com. Right. On markmbello.com, if you go there, you can download... Uh, a free novella that's a holocaust story called the door vador from generation to generation the door vador is hebrew mm -hmm. and it and it literally means from generation to generation right the the book is a prequel to the zachary blake legal thriller series it tells the story of zachary's grandfather who promises on the day of zachary's bar mitzvah that he will tell him the story of his escape from Auschwitz during World War II. Mm -hmm. And the boy is, it's Friday night, the night before his bar mitzvah, and he basically sits his grandfather down and makes him tell him the story of, of his escape from Auschwitz. It's a neat little 40-page um, novella that, explains to people why Zachary Blake became an attorney. I so like it's fun. that. It's fun and it's free. That sounds wonderful. Well, good luck to you. I'm so glad you came on. You had a lot of great, insightful information, and I loved hearing about all your books. They're Thank very, you. very creative, and I like how you kind of dipped into a lot of different areas from politics to mystery to children's books, teaching you know children about different things to your cookbook. And now your new book that's coming out, that sounds very exciting. I can't wait to see it. Thank you. There's that bias you're talking about. I mean, when you, when you, when you write Riff from the headlines, obviously your, your opinions about the issues become relevant to what you're going to write. Right. So there, there, you know, there's, I, I can't not be who I am. Of course. But I, but I do try to tell the truth as, as I see it. And I, and then, and then there's these other, these other things that have nothing to do with politics or, or, um, justice issues like, right. like, like the, uh, the last in the series, you have the right to remain silent or this new book, the final steps, um, if, just fun to do something different for a change. Oh, definitely. <laughs> definitely. Well, you've accomplished a lot. And thank you. Thank you. I, I am very, very impressed with all these different uh, books and all the things you accomplished prior to writing. So um, it was very, it was very interesting and very insightful to have you on our show. Thank you so much. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate oh, you're, it. you're very welcome. And you have a great day. You too.